Today, we're answering the most pressing question on every investor's mind. What stocks to buy at all-time highs? But before we get into that, I have an exciting opportunity for you. Winston's portfolio is up over 50% so far this year. He trades two to three hours a week and he follows a simple three-step system that allows him to automate all the stuff so he can spend most of the day on the beach chasing, you know, squirrels or whatever he chases, eating dead fish. He does like to do that. Very odd. So we're hosting an exclusive live trading training on Tuesday, 10 a.m. Eastern time, 3 p.m. London time. And if you want to learn how we made over 100% last year and the year before, get yourself a free ticket. Felixfriends.org slash webinar, and I'll see you over there. All right, let's set the stage here. The stock market is at an all-time high. The Nasdaq, the S&P, and the Dow Jones are all breaking records. But what does that mean for you? Should you buy, hold, or even sell? Stick around, because we're going to break it all down, and I promise there's a twist you won't see coming. Winston here has been sniffing out some incredible research for today's video. Trust me, you don't want to miss this. And for you to get the maximum value out of this video, where he's also prepared a complete walkthrough document for you with all the stocks we discuss. So just go and download it for free at felixfriends.org slash ATH, felixfriends.org slash ATH, all the links are at the top of the description. First, let's talk about the bull market. Howard Marks, a renowned investor, explains that bull markets have three stages. The first stage is when only a few exceptionally bright people, like Winston, see the potential for improvement. The second stage is when most people recognize that improvement is happening. And the third stage is when everyone believes things will get better forever. We're in that third stage now. So buckle up. So what does this mean for you? Well, buying the third stage can be risky because prices are high and the potential for substantial losses increases. But don't worry, we've got strategies to navigate this. Now let's address the perma bears. These are folks who always predict doom and gloom. Uh, the investor channel chap, Colin, who's a great channel, by the way, check it out, warns that these bears will pivot from saying the market will crash to claiming stocks are overvalued. It's a constant cycle of fear mongering and it gets clicks, which is why it's so popular. But here's the kicker. Timing the market is nearly impossible. Even the best investors can't consistently predict market highs and lows. So what should you do? Stay tuned because we're about to reveal some actionable strategies. One proven strategy is dollar cost averaging. This means investing a fixed amount of money at regular intervals, regardless of the market's condition. Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, swore by this method. He believed that staying the course and not letting market fluctuations dictate your actions is key to long-term success. By consistently investing, you smooth out the highs and lows, reducing the risk of making poor decisions based on short-term market movements. Warren Buffett often says that the best time to invest was yesterday. The second best time is today. Historically, the stock market has always trended upwards over the long term. Even during periods of horrible stagnation like the 17 years from 1964 to 1981, the market eventually rebounded and reached new highs. So the people who kept buying stocks from 1964 to 1981, which was one of the most frustrating 17 years in history, guess what happened to their wealth when the market rebounded? They'd been buying for 17 years at these low levels and then suddenly Whoosh. So if you believe in the long-term growth of the economy, investing at all-time highs shouldn't scare you. It's about time in the market, not timing the market. Now, I know many of you are heavily invested in tech and AI stocks, seeking those maximum returns. And you're not just looking for average gains. You want to hit it big or bigly, as your next president might say. So what should you be tracking to ensure you're making the best investment decisions? Winston and I have dug deep into this, and here are the key three metrics you should focus on. The first is earnings per share growth. This indicates how much profit a company is making per share of its stock but the growth part basically says, how much is it growing? And it's a much, much stronger indicator of a company's profitability and where the market's heading than pretty much anything else out there. So you want to look at quarter by quarter, year by year for the stocks you own. Is their growth accelerating? Is it flatlining? 
or is it coming down? And that will tell you a great deal about the stock and also the industry and maybe where you should be allocating your funds. Item number two is return on invested capital. I know it's incredibly sexy, isn't it? But this measure essentially tells you how effectively a company is using its capital to generate profits. A high ROIC indicates that the company is using its resources efficiently to create value for shareholders. So say NVIDIA invests their money, are they getting a high ROIC out of it? At the moment, yeah, it's a crazy number, but track that number. If it starts to come down, it's telling you, okay, margins are getting a little bit compressed somewhere. It's no longer as efficient as rewarding to build the new you know, R&D center or whatever it is that they're investing their money in. And then the third, and probably the most simple, especially for you growth investors, is revenue growth. So if you are in tech and AI companies, a lot of them not necessarily profitable yet, rapid revenue growth gives you a signal that the company is successfully capturing market share and expanding its business. And initially, all we care about with the growth businesses that it's growing. And there are a lot of growth companies out there that are not growing. They're like identifying themselves as growth companies, but let's face it, they are non-growth companies. And we could have a conversation about other people as well who identify as all sorts of things, but let's not get too political here. So if you track those three things, and it might sound like a lot of work, but honestly, how many stocks do you own? You type into Google, your stock name, say you own Microsoft, you type in Microsoft ROIC, right? write it down or find a chart and then record that. Get yourself a notebook. Like I have a notebook. I always do. And I record on it what I invest in, ideally a page for each stock or maybe a couple of pages for each stock. And then you know, and then you know if it's getting better or if it's getting worse. So by tracking these metrics, you can make more informed decisions and potentially maximize your returns. Because remember, it's not about picking the right stock, but also about understanding the financial health of the companies you're investing in. Now, let's get specific here. Here are some tech and AI stocks to consider, along with their corresponding ETFs. And I put all of this also into the document. You can download at felixfriends.org slash ATH. And these I put in here for diversification, because I know some people are like, I really want to put my money into Tesla or NVIDIA or whatever it is. But you have access to the world's greatest stock market. You have access to the world's greatest companies. And if you value stability and sleep, you're going to want to diversify a little bit into a couple of stocks at the very least. I probably own about 30 stocks in total, although it's fairly top heavy. Top 10 is probably the vast majority. Stock number one, Apple. Why? Strong earnings per share growth. Yeah, revenue isn't growing that much, but they're getting more profitable. Why? Service revenue is getting more profitable. And let's face it, they're not spending much money on R&D, are they? <laughs> uh, and the ROIC is also very, very high. Now, there's some ETF options for this. QQQ would basically get you a lot of Apple. Stock number two, Microsoft. They're a leader in cloud computing, in AI, in gaming, in... You're using Windows, you're using a computer, probably, right? You're using Microsoft, whatever, Office, probably. How many companies lose Outlook and everything else? So they just have a very, very dominant market position, especially in enterprise software and enterprises, as in companies, don't like to change software because it's a huge pain in the neck and nobody can be bothered. So how would you get your hands on a lot, a lot of that if you wanted to get an, an, an ETF? Uh, something like XLK would get you quite a lot of Microsoft. Stock number three, NVIDIA. Why? Dominant in AI and GPU tech, right? Rapid, rapid revenue growth. And I think we'll continue to dominate the space for some time. You can also find some ETFs that have a lot of this. SOX would be my favorite. S-O-X-X, -X, which is the semiconductor um, ETF by iShares. Next on my list would be Google. Why? Advertising. Advertising and advertising. People are always going to want to advertise, right? They want to sell something. They want to win an election or, you know, whatever else it is. They want to advertise. Where are they going to go? They're going to go to whoever has the biggest reach. Google, one of the two companies in the world with the biggest reach. So I like it uh, for, for those reasons. Um, you can get a lot of, ET, of, of Google, obviously, in QQQ. Uh, there would also be something like Vanguard's Information Technology ETF, uh, ticker symbol VGT to look at. Next, Tesla. Why? Well, not they're not just only the leader in EVs, in AI-driven 
autonomous driving, which I think is where the real money will be made. But they're also cooking up a lot of stuff like the energy business and robots and everything else. Um, you can get a lot of that in Arc K. And yeah, people are like, oh my God, Arc's really underperformed. And I don't understand all the stocks that they buy or why they buy it. And I'm not a particular fan, but I appreciate that it's cyclical. When interest rates are high, innovation funds like ARK will do very badly. Interest rates are high. So you've got to judge them on the whole cycle. And what most people do is when they were at the top and interest rates were zero, everyone's like, she's a hero. And, you know, Buffett's over. And now interest rates are high. Everyone's like, we love Buffett. We love Kathy. And you just got to have a little bit of a longer perspective. And if you look at it from a longer time frame point of view, innovation stocks are pretty cheap right now. Right? So before we wrap it up, don't forget about our exclusive live trading training on Tuesday, where we share the exact strategies that have helped us achieve over 100% return on capital employed in each of the last two years, up over 50% so far this year. There were only about 200 tickets or so left as I started recording this. So head over to felixfriends.org slash webinar and grab yourself a spot. You're not going to want to miss Winston's insights. And if you found this video useful, share it with a friend. I love you for watching. Take care. Tom Lee famously just predicted a 15,000 point S&P 500. So I dug deep into his research and I'm about to unveil to you his top five stocks.